Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine Quijano. It is good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. After months of negotiations, the text of a long-awaited bipartisan infrastructure bill has been unveiled. Senators convened for a rare weekend session to finalize the wording of the package with roughly more than half a billion dollars of new spending. Next, lawmakers on both sides will propose amendments to the bill. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is aiming to wrap up the process by the end of the week. I'd encourage senators from both sides of the aisle to submit potential amendments to the bill. And as, as we have already done several times this year on the Anti-Asian Hate Crimes Bill and the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, just to name two examples, the majority will work with the minority to put together packages of amendments for the Senate to vote on. At the moment, we need consent from our Republican colleagues to start the amendment process and we await their answer. I hope we can use our time in the Senate efficiently. Let's start voting on amendments. The longer it takes to finish the bill, the longer we'll be here. Should that happen, the Senate would move on to what's expected to be a more contentious fight, passing President Biden's expansion of Medicare, child tax credits, and more. In the meantime, internal divisions are starting to show among Democrats on everything from infrastructure to a lapsed moratorium on evictions. More on that in a moment. But first, the U.S. is seeing more new COVID cases than any point since January. Florida is becoming the epicenter of the latest outbreak. The state broke their record for hospitalizations Sunday, with more than 10,000 people receiving treatment for the virus. Dr. Anthony Fauci downplayed the alarm over cases among the vaccinated. No vaccine is 100 percent effective. And so you can expect breakthrough infections. So even with a high vaccine effectiveness, most of these infections are going to be asymptomatic or mild. And we know that. We've already seen that from the experience in Massachusetts, in Provincetown, and we see it in all other situations. Get vaccinated. I say that every single time we all say it. The COVID vaccines give strong protection against the Delta variant, and it protects you, your family, and your community. Despite COVID's resurgence spread, a new morning consult survey shows roughly one-fifth of Americans say they would resign from their jobs if their employer forced them to vaccinate, mask, or regularly submit to COVID testing. For more, let's bring in Natalie Brand, Zeke Miller, and Liz Goodwin. Natalie is reporting on Capitol Hill for CBS News. Zeke is a CBSN political contributor and White House reporter for the Associated Press. And Liz is the Boston Globe's Washington bureau chief. Welcome to you all. Zeke, let me start with you. At this point, just over half the country remains unvaccinated. How are politics impacting the government's ability to close that gap? No, they, they really are everything uh, to closing that gap uh, right now, uh, both at, at the federal level, given, uh, you know, in terms of the, the Biden administration's ability to meet, meet its commitments just today, uh, the U.S. met that uh, that 70 percent goal that uh, President Biden laid out to try to hit by July 4th of uh, of uh, 70 percent of adult Americans being at least partially vaccinated. But really, most importantly, it's, ha it's taking place at the local level and in people's homes and on their social media channels. Uh, it, it, you know, like everything else in our society right now, partisanship is it, uh, is, it, it is abound in, in, in sort of cultural issues and now in public health as well. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, both in, in, in particular states' responses to this, late, this latest outbreak, particularly of the, of the surging Delta variant. Uh, in Florida, there, uh, there, Governor Ron DeSantis has decided uh, against imposing uh, any sort of state mandates and, is, is, and also tried to block local officials from, from, from imposing them and enforcing them there as well, as well as uh, vaccine uh, mandates in, in that state. That is something that the White House has sharply condemned, saying that every tool needs to be put in place here to stop the spread there. Uh, so it, it, we're seeing, you know, two, we've seen two Americas break, uh, sort of develop uh, in our country over the last several years on a lot of different issues. And uh, vaccinations and, and, and broader public health now is, 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 is nothing new in that regard. It just happens to be that, you know, here at stake are people's lives and livelihoods. Yeah, I mean, this two Americas that you're talking about, this debate is likely to continue. Um, let's turn to infrastructure, Natalie. The big sticking point for the infrastructure bill was paying for it. So what did lawmakers agree to and what were the big concessions made by both sides? 
Well, hi, Elaine. This is a roughly trillion dollar infrastructure package. And as you mentioned, the sticking point was really how to pay for it. Uh, we know that Republican negotiators uh, were very much opposed to, to the idea of, of new taxes, raising the corporate tax rate. Uh, so one of the uh, concessions here was really to, to try to find ways around that. Uh, and that's where we got tax enforcement, stepping up tax enforcement, uh, including on cryptocurrencies, from what we understand. Uh, and then also looking at some of the unused uh, COVID relief funding. Uh, that was another area uh, where lawmakers, the group of Republicans and Democrats negotiating, were able to, to finally come to an agreement uh, and find common ground uh, around uh, a number of these pay fors. Uh, and again, they're really uh, touting a, a win here in terms of crafting this massive piece of legislation, which the text finally released late Sunday. We're talking about uh, a little more than 2,700 pages. So everyone's still trying to go through that page by page, uh, line by line. But we're talking about tens of billions of dollars in new spending uh, for roads and bridges, uh, for broadband, for clean water, uh, and also public transit and railways. Uh, more than $500 billion in new spending overall. So uh, this is a massive bill that now uh, has a, a little bit of a ways to go because what we're looking at this week is the amendment process uh, and that could take some time still a little unclear how long that will take but senate majority leader chuck schumer has made clear that he wants to keep things moving along he's confident uh, that a final vote could happen this week. That's his target. Um, but then you have the Senate Minority Leader, Mitch McConnell, who's also saying, uh, agreeing that this is a good first step, but saying let's not rush the, pro the process here. Uh, and so we'll really have to see how this whole amendment process now plays out on the Senate floor. Yeah, Liz, I want to get um, your reporting here on that as well. What is it that you have been um, learning about this time frame? Because, you know, before this infrastructure bill can pass, two more procedural votes need to happen. The next step, Natalie points out, is for senators to propose the amendments. We're hearing about the approximate time frame here. What is it that you're learning about that? How long is this amendment process expected to take? Well, as Natalie mentioned, the timetable is really the next uh, sort of area of conflict between the two parties. Chuck Schumer has been uh, really urging the bipartisan group to move faster at every stage. We've seen him say, you know, this week, this week, it has to happen. And, and it did finally happen over the mm -hmm. weekend. And now he, he's pushing them to move as fast as possible on amendments, while, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell is saying, slow your roll. We want a lot of time to debate amendments. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's 17 Republicans who voted to move forward with this debate and want to have this debate over amendments. And it's just a delicate balance between Schumer wanting to make sure that this vote is not delayed and that, um, you know, it doesn't eat into the whole recess and that they don't lose momentum on it, uh, but also not wanting to lose the Republicans he does have signed on, um, some of whom have some bipartisan amendments that he was saying we could see as early as today. There's three he wants to move forward on uh, pretty quickly. But at the end of the day, it's unclear if he would allow more messaging amendments, things that Republicans might find useful politically. I think he does want to keep uh, pretty tight control over what happens and keep everyone on a pretty quick time timeline. In the meantime, Zeke, progressives are upset with the Biden administration about the nationwide ban on evictions expiring. Here's New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The House and House leadership had the opportunity to vote to extend the moratorium. And there were many, and there was frankly a handful of conservative Democrats in the House that threatened to get on planes rather than hold this vote. And we have to um, really just call a spade a spade. We cannot 
in good faith blame the Republican Party when House Democrats have a majority. Now, there is something to be said for the fact that this court order came down on the White House a month ago, and the White House waited until the day before the House adjourned to release a statement asking on Congress to extend the moratorium. So, Zeke, how is the White House addressing this criticism from progressives? You know, we, we've seen a bit of a pass the buck uh, taking place in Washington over the last, you know, 24 hours or so. This deadline, as as Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez men mentioned, you know, uh, that this injection moratorium was going, to, was going to expire over the weekend was not news to anyone. Uh, what was news is sort of the surge in the Delta variant, uh, and that the pandemic, which everyone sort of thought was going to be in the rearview mirror, wasn't quite as much in the rearview mirror as everyone hoped. Uh, so it was a little bit more of an urgent situation. So over the last 72, 96 hours, what we've seen, you know, from Capitol Hill with Democrats and sort of pointing to the White House, hey, Biden administration, White House, do more, use your executive authority here, uh, file legal challenges uh, to that, that Supreme Court decision uh, to, try, to try to keep this eviction more in, in place. What we heard from the White House today, and what they've been saying pretty emphatically over the last you know, several, several days now, has been they, don't, they do not believe that they have any legal authority to extend that eviction moratorium unilaterally. Uh, you know, obviously, yes, that request came uh, uh, to Congress over the last, just over the last several days now. Uh, but you know they're saying, look, look, look. As much as they're they're getting uh, incoming flack from Democrats on Capitol Hill, they're saying Democrats on the Hill have to look inward themselves. And uh, the White House now is trying to spin this to uh, appease some of the pro progressive criticism here by saying, look, states, local governments, landlords, uh, you got to do more and step up and fill in the gap here and act where for Congress for the federal government. Uh, either because of inaction uh, or, or because they don't have the legal authority to act, um, haven't been able to step up and, and, and solve the gap there. So this is, you know, they're, they're, everyone is sort of pointing fingers at everybody else. Um, and the, the question is sort of everyone is looking to over the next, you know, several days right now is, and, and several weeks is just how many people will, be, will lose their homes um, in this interim period. If there's a sharp outcry, we could see a renewed push on both the White House and Congress to move quickly on a and acting to try to keep people in their homes. Or it could be muted, and that sort of really is sort of everyone's sort of in a little bit of a wait and see mode as they point fingers. So, Natalie, to follow up on what Zeke was saying there, the House has already started its seven-week summer recess. Could they come back to deal with this eviction moratorium? Well, I think there's a recognition, the, the complicated uh, challenge of getting something uh, passed through both chambers. Uh, in that respect. But I will say this, there's now a shift uh, in messaging on a, a sense of urgency uh, that, that lawmakers and the White House are placing on state and local jurisdictions to try to expedite and speed the distribution of the tens of billions of dollars that's already been approved to help with rental assistance, emergency rental assistance. We're talking about around $46 billion dollars that's been approved by Congress. And according to uh, our CBS News reporting, just about $3 billion of that uh, actually had gone out uh, by the end of June. So now we're seeing a lot of statements by Speaker Pelosi, by the White House, uh, urging these these states and localities that have not yet released this funding to try to speed up that process. We also know, uh, according to the House Speaker, that the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, is expected to brief members uh, on Tuesday about this emergency assistance. And maybe there's a, a better uh, overall look at why it's taking so long in some jurisdictions uh, for this aid to get to those, the millions of Americans who need it right now. Um, we're also hearing uh, the messaging from the White House urging state and local governments that have not yet put in uh, extended protections in place uh, to, to, to extend the moratorium for at least two months. That's what we heard uh, from the White House today. This comes as uh, there's already a group of states, including California, uh, New 
New York, New Jersey, Illinois, to name a, just a few that already took it upon themselves to, to extend uh, the moratorium uh, in its state. Uh, and one more thing we're hearing uh, from the White House on Monday is uh, a call to state and local courts uh, to, for now, pause uh, proceedings, eviction proceedings, until the tenants and the landlords can actually seek access to the aid, again, the tens of billions of dollars that's already been uh, approved by Congress to help with this problem. Well, Liz, time is also running out for Congress to raise the debt ceiling, which funds the gap between what the federal government spends and the revenue they bring in. Now, we didn't hear a lot about the debt in the previous administration um, when it came to Republicans, but Republicans are threatening to vote against raising the debt ceiling now without spending cuts. When did the GOP become more fiscally minded? And what happens if lawmakers can't figure it out by the end of the month? Yeah, that's a great point, Elaine. I mean, they suspended the debt ceiling in 2019. Members of both parties voted for that, and we really didn't hear a lot about it. There really wasn't a huge debate about fiscal responsibility, et cetera. And yet, with um, Biden in the White House and Democrats with their narrow control of Congress, it does feel like Republicans have sort of rediscovered um, this concern about the debt um, in a new way. And given that both parties have increased spending in, in recent years, I think that is a frustration that Democrats are feeling now that Republicans really want to put this uh, tough vote completely on Democrats' shoulders. And essentially, the clock has started ticking now where the federal, where the Treasury is taking uh, measures to conserve cash so that they don't have to default on the U.S. debt. But there would be a moment where that would actually happen if they don't ex uh, raise the ceiling, maybe October, November. Um, experts aren't really sure. Janet Yellen says it's hard to predict right now because of COVID and other sort of unusual things going on with the economy. So it is possible for Democrats to uh, to raise that debt ceiling on their own. That's something that Republicans are saying, hey, they can just do it via reconciliation with 50 votes. Um, and there's uh, sort of a feeling that there's a political reason behind that where Republicans can then say Democrats are owning you know, the, the debt and, and they can paint a picture of irresponsible spending given that Democrats are also pushing for 3.5 trillion in additional spending for the reconciliation package that goes along with the infrastructure spending. Um, and it might end up being that that ends up what happens, that Democrats have to take that vote on their own. It doesn't seem like there's a real danger of an actual default. And Congress, even though there's been drama in the past, they've never actually let the U.S. default. They always eventually solve this, uh, mm -hmm. this battle. And I think most people think that will happen again this time, but it might just be Democrats on their own. All right. Finally, Zeke, as the U.S. nears completion of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, there are growing concerns over the threat of retaliation from the Taliban against Afghans who helped the U.S. during the war. How is the White House addressing this? You know, we heard today from the State Department that uh, they were expanding the criteria for um, Afghan nationals who either worked for uh, U.S.-funded nonprofit, uh, non-governmental organizations, worked for U.S. media organizations, others who, uh, other Afghan citizens who would feel a credible threat uh, to their lives uh, 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 should the Taliban continue its its, its takeover of much of Afghanistan, uh, particularly if it were to uh, take over uh, Kabul, the capital there. Um, there's a significant catch to that, uh, unlike those who uh, worked uh, directly for the State Department or uh, served as, particularly those who served as interpreters for the U.S. military, many of whom, along with their families, are set, set to be uh, uh, airlifted out of Afghanistan in the next four weeks before the formal end of the U.S. military mission um, in Afghanistan. They'll have to leave themselves and, and go to a third country and, and wait there for, you know, the better part of, uh, you know, a year or two to allow for the processing of those visa applications um, to the United States. That's an expensive prospect. Uh, they have to find a, 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 it is a very complicated process for some of those individuals. So the White House, the Biden administration have been under a lot of pressure over the last several, several 
weeks and months now to make sure that they're taking care of these Afghan civilians who've worked, uh, worked uh, alongside the U.S. military and the State Department, but also for U.S. contractors and other uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, this is a, certainly a, 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 a first step that a lot of advocates have been calling for, but it's certainly not the end of this story. There's probably going to be another another shoe to drop there as more pressure is exerted on the Biden administration to do more to help that that population. Right. As these advocates have been stressing the urgent nature of this, especially with the Taliban continuing to retake back a lot of that territory. All right. Natalie Brand, Zeke Miller and Liz Goodwin, thank you very much. Really appreciate it.